we should be live. And we're live. Welcome everybody to your favorite weekly series, uh, Grace Under Pressure, where we're interviewing some of your favorite royal consorts from around the known world, starting with some well-known duchesses. This week we are interviewing Duchess Zenobia. Next week we'll be interviewing Duchess B of Lo, Lo, someone help Lo me out Cock. here. Lo Lo Cock. Lo Cock. Lo Cock. <laughs> and now let's meet our host. Hello, everyone. I will introduce my co host, Sir Joel de Grace, who started in the SCA in what is now North Shield and is now in Calentier, by the way, of the Outlands and Artemisia. He's like a mini SCA UN, which is pretty charming. And um, he was knighted in 2018 and is still working on his courtly manners. And we all have high hopes for him and um, is inspired in these efforts by the Honorable Lady Anyella. And fun fact about Joel for this week is that he once got to attend a fighter practice in Afghanistan. And I'm assuming that's an SCA fighter practice. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. But <laughs> so. I don't think we can call like the whole uh, military presence in Afghanistan just one big fight practice. Um, no, that's that's fight for real. No, I was uh, <laughs> fortunate enough uh, where I was at in a area with a large air base and mm -hmm. uh, there were some airmen there and they happened to have extra armor. So I was able to, we were just there on layover from a mission and I was able to suit up with them and got to uh, get a little bit of the stick time in while over there. It was, awesome. a, great, awesome. it was a great, great break from everything. So, and as always, I am joined by my co-host and primary heckler, Duchess Dagger of <laughs> Ontier. Her first reign was as Princess of Sinagua in the West, and she has since gone on to have two reigns in Ontier with her husband, Duke Thorne Yalson. Two weeks in a row, nailed. Got it right. I know, I'm on a roll now. Uh, this week's fun fact about her grace is that when she stares into the abyss, the abyss usually can't maintain eye contact for more than a few seconds. Very intimidating. I mean, don't I seem intimidating? I yeah, considering how we first met you, yeah, I would say so. So, as always, we'd like to extend a special thank you to Ashaxi and Rifkin for hosting Grace Under Pressure on the Sisters Interview Network, and we so appreciate them and everything that they do to make these interviews possible. And now, Joel, would you please introduce our esteemed guest? Oh, I absolutely would be honored to. Everybody watching, thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and attention coming in. This week, we are so lucky to be joined by Duchess Zenobia. Not even going to try your last name. You. That's, yeah, that's what I said. Um, uh, she is a pelican. She has reigned in the West, and she is also a holder of the Paragon of Merriment, which is an award that I really want to get back to whenever this gets going on. Uh, Your Grace, thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. For us. I'm very honored to be here this week. We are really fortunate to have you. Thank you for taking the time out of your uh, schedule and also your parenting schedule. I know that your boys are your heart and soul and mm -hmm. probably uh, occupy a great deal of your time, especially during the pandemic. So thank yeah. you for being here. Um, we always like to start with just a softball, um, uh, just talking about your SCA origins and what brought you to the SCA. Uh, back in 1990, uh, I was dating this weird guy and um, he, he was the very, I was, I was 21 and I'd never had a boyfriend before. I'd never even been on a date before. And I was set up on a blind date with this very weird guy. And um, we kind of hit it off because I'm weird also. Um, and he said, hey, I do this thing and it's kind of weird like me, but you know, I, I just want you to try it out. Just, just, you know, give it a shot. And I was like, sure, whatever. So I was a ANS counselor at a Girl Scout camp and he sent me away to camp with the Known World Handbook. And at the end of the summer was the Shire of Stromgard's anniversary tournament and feast. And at that point, um, we had become engaged. And so they decided to turn the event into a, not only just the anniversary tournament, but they decided to turn it into our betrothal feast. Nice. So my very first event, um, I show up in this dress that I had made uh, based on uh, a picture that I saw in the Gnome World Handbook mm -hmm. of this hoop blonde with dag angel wing sleeves and I made it out of this really awful peach polyester satin but it was beautiful to me and we show up and I'm showing um, the yes, picture that, 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 <laughs> that, that, that's from my very first event 
and uh, there were people giving me gifts and we sat at the high table and Aww. some bard came and sang a song of my grace and beauty and I'm like yeah this I'm totally up for this and um it was about 20 years before I sat at another high table again but it was awful fun and I was hooked <laughs> right from the beginning and I have no idea where that guy ended up I I think he dropped out of the SCA a million years ago but here I am. I have two, I have two thoughts about this. Number one, in the spectrum of weird things a boyfriend could ask you to try out, this seems like a pretty like low to medium risk. So that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, you know, yeah. it could have that's been much worse. To take it. That's right. And number two, um, I think if we had every new to the SCA person, like sit at the high table and have like a big deal made out of them. Uh, you know, maybe would, yeah. maybe people would stay longer. Um, mm -hmm. But because if you go straight to cleaning out Biff's and having to unpack an endless stream of trailers, it's not quite as attractive, right? right so right, right. yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. We should probably have like a newcomer <laughs> event where there's just this big one long high table and everybody who is their first event, they sit at the high, I mean, if they want to. And we all stare at them. That sounds yeah, really low I mean, key and awesome. <laughs> super, super aggressive eye contact. So um, um, the Outlands does a newcomers event, and Artemisia has started it. But um, but yeah, Outlands has an awesome newcomers event where they do something like that, where they're basically like, "Hey, this day is all about y'all," and it's awesome and full of one on one classes. And yeah, they have like two, like you know tables of honor at peace, and it, yeah, cool. it's really cool. So. What's your persona, Zenobia? Uh, I am a 16th century noblewoman in the court of Eleanor Toledo in Florence, awesome. to be very specific. See, Joel, awesome. when you have a persona, you can answer like wh what time period you're from, what your clothes, like all of that. It, it's a package. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a persona. <laughs> Thank you. Other than stick jock, I, I really do. I swear, I am not just token stick jock. So, so um, your grace, you have been fortunate enough to have um, a couple of uh, rings and been able to experience it. And looking at your OP, you've been involved in um, uh, quite a few rings that were not your own. Mm -hmm. What would current you go back and tell pre-first reign you, or you know, what advice would you give to a new consort that may be looking to? step up for the first time? So the first piece of advice that I give anybody is um, if you think that your fighter has any hope of winning at all, clean your house before you leave for the event. Like before you leave for the tournament, clean your house. Because as soon as they win, you will not have a clean house until well after you step down. So clean it now. And if you don't win, awesome, you have a clean house. And if you do win, prepare to not have a clean house for any more than just that one weekend. But that's the first piece of advice that I would give. Um, the, the more serious piece of advice, um, prepare to find out things that you don't really want to find out about people who you love. And that's the hardest piece that's the hardest thing to absorb they you know they tell you all of the magical wonderful things about being queen and it is magical and wonderful but there's a lot of things that they don't tell you about mm -hmm. that they really should you should walk into this eyes wide open and I thought I mean I had already been a pelican for over a decade I'd been a kingdom officer forever I'd been really involved at the kingdom level, at my principality level, at my baronial level, I thought I had a good bead on what was going on. And I walked into five banishments. Yeah. I mean, we only ended up following through on one of them because they, they take um, time to investigate, which they should. But that was really, um, that was a harsh reality to walk in on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing is, when, when that final blow is struck and you are named crown princess, you walk into that role with whatever it is you had. 
you don't instantly you're not instantly gifted with grace and charm and poise and patience and theatrical ability. None of that mm -hmm. is given to you when they place that crown on your head. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't develop those skills throughout your reign, but don't think that suddenly, you know, it's just something that you have on day one. It doesn't happen. But hopefully by the time you step down, you will have learned some grace and some poise and some you know, ability to be charming and, and patient. Um, but that's, that's a hard, another hard thing to deal with is, you know, you don't, you're, you're not magically queenly. So you're it saying is, you need to learn some grace under pressure? Ah, ah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Are you just now getting that joke, Joel? Is yeah. that the? No, but I've been trying to name drop the title of the series. Like, <laughs> like, like I, that job, was just good a good, that was a good opportunity. <laughs> well, this this is a really good segue into my next question, which is as you know, the West has traditions and customs that are quite different from other kingdoms. And we love to dive a little bit into the inner kingdom sort of anthropological um, cultural differences, but it's especially useful that you've lived now in the West End on tier. So you have that dual perspective. And um, what are some of the more significant differences now that you've lived in two kingdoms and have observed that? Um, one of the things, well, I mean, the, the thing that uh, the West is really well known for out there on their at the Crown tournaments, not only that we have open lists, but also our roses tournament, which happens usually after fourth round. Uh, they collapse the fields while the uh, those who are still in the tournament are in the two fields that are closest to the thrones. The fields on the back end are open for uh, what we call the roses tournament. And, and what it is, is any fighter can challenge any other fighter and they fight and they determine the the rules of victory, you know, best out of three or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever. And whoever wins, they, they get to um, ask the person who they bested to go and get a rose from the queen or the princess, depending on the tournament, and deliver that rose to whoever they choose. It could be their inspiration. Um, I mean, you know, it could be their sweetheart. It could be somebody else who inspires them. Someone who's running the lists or the autocrat or a good dear friend. And that is one of my favorite little bits of, of West Kingdom tradition that I know some other kingdoms have started to adopt. And I know um, they've done it in Ontario a couple of times, but um, that is one of the really uh, wonderful, magical pieces of mm -hmm. our, our tournament. Not only because it, it allows people to continue fighting, because it kind of sucks to get there and be out in two. Um, but also it helps the fighters to develop their courtly graces. Um, not only are they presenting themselves to the queen to ask for that rose, but then they're going and they're presenting that rose to whoever the champion asked them to. So, you know, it gets them into that habit of, you know, how do I talk to her majesty? And how do I talk to these people who are coming up to me? You know, I have to go and, you know, these strange strangers who I don't necessarily know and you know they they try to speak forcefully and some do it better than others but it's always such a wonderful experience to be the recipient of those roses and also as a fighter to be the person who delivers those I mean that I mean that I I loved doing that it was such a fun experience for me as a fighter so that's that's one of my my favorite things that I, I wish and it's so fun there. because they get to know all the consorts on the field too mm -hmm. and so they have to be able to identify them and figure out you know gracefully where they're seated and go approach them it's really lovely and I have to say also I looked at my OP listing and was looking at all the queen's ciphers I received mm -hmm. received you know which is the award of course that the queen of the west gives mm -hmm. to someone who is helpful in her reign and how I was like, how many of those were from stripping thorns off roses? Because <laughs> you sit 
<laughs> with yep. this huge bucket of roses and you have to take all the thorns off before you hand them out. And there's usually a gaggle of people sitting mm -hmm. there with thorn strippers and gloves on pulling all the thorns off the roses if you couldn't buy thornless roses that time of year for, you know, a good price. So it's just, I don't know, it just, it was one of those memories like sitting in a dry field in the middle of central California pulling thorns off roses. So anyway, <laughs> I've got, I've, I've got kind of a question um, actually that just kind of popped up back. Um, what do, what kind of pre-court ritual do you usually have before a court? Like, um, do you have kind of like the same pattern that you follow before every court or? So, um, yes, uh, I was very, so this is a big, huge difference between the West and Ontario, and everybody knows about it. So it's not like any, you know, big rev revelation. But one of the things that, that um, I was very adamant about is that our courts be no more than an hour long. So courts up here are not an hour long. But um, one of the things that, that I um, would try my best at is to get with my heralds and consult with them. You know, let me see the, the docket of business that you've gotten during the day. And we would go through and go, okay, yes, no, yes, no. And try to figure out um, and go through uh, whatever awards we're going to give um, because a lot of the awards in the West are also given by the the prince, prince and princesses, um, I wanted to check with them to say, hey, I'm giving this leaf of merit to somebody. Do you already have that on your docket? Or, you know, I would try to consult with them just to make sure that we're not, you know, double dipping in the same court. Um, but I really wanted to make sure that I was as prepared as possible. Um, number one, I'm a pellet can. Um, but also, um, I get uh, stage fright pretty bad. Um, I've been a theater my whole life, but I still get stage fright and just having that little bit of, okay, I've got all my lines memorized. I know the order of business. I know the way everything is going to run. So as long as there are no disruptions in court whatsoever, then we're good. But uh, that's kind of how I'd run things. Well, your Pelican heart will appreciate this. In our first reign a million years ago at this point, um, we had a 12th night that was one of those like potential to be a six hour court. And we were trying so hard to strip that thing down. And that was the first rain that we uh, really scheduled all of the peerages to happen at specific times in the court mm -hmm. and said, okay, one will be at one o'clock, one will be at one thirty, one will be at two o'clock because there had been this backlog of peerages that had to be made. And you know how people just gather at the back of court and it's very disruptive. And also if you have non SCA family members that are coming mm -hmm. to the event and all of that. So we scheduled all of the peerages to happen at specific times, specifically because on tier courts, especially those 12th night courts can be really brutal. And, um, you know, it really was a very humane way to have all of those big peerages happen. And I, I feel like, you know, anything you can do to make court more tolerable, um, you know, those really long courts is so important. It does also help that the West has three reigns a year, which I know most people listening will be aware of that, but there may be people who aren't, that it's the only kingdom that has mm -hmm. three instead of two reigns. So you have that additional set of crown events each year, which has mm -hmm. its own challenges, but it also means that you can take care of more court business. You know, you can have an hour court mm -hmm. if you're really diligent and careful like you were. So that's cool. And it's also humane and I appreciate it. So <laughs> very much. We also did things like make sure we had runners yeah. who would go and find yes. the people and make sure that they were there when we gave the award, you know, and we didn't, we never waited. Like if, mm -hmm. if we called somebody, you know, we'd wait for like, you know, a minute and then, okay, move on. We'll do it next. Yeah. You know, that's no, really good. And it, and it, probably showed I wasn't in the kingdom for your courts but I'm mm -hmm. sure it showed in the way things were organized and you know I hope that anybody listening to these interviews if they're if they are able to seek some kind of guidance from them or will seek out people that have been interviewed to make courts more efficient and it's not just for people reigning but if somebody's like really excited to be someone's head of court mm -hmm. like 
go talk to people like Synovia, go talk to, you know, people who have done this work and have done it well and talk to them about, you know, what you can do to make it so that people can sit through these courts more, you know, with more patience and yeah. it's more fun and all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I've, I've made jokes before to some of my friends, uh, especially uh, Duchess Cortland, who was on the show last week, that if I ever happen to uh, be given the opportunity to reign, that uh, I'm going to be having a pelican just follow me around nonstop because I go from point A to point B really, really quickly and don't always think about connecting the dots sometimes. So I, I need a babysitter is basically what, what that comes down to. Hey, um, Joel, I just want to be clear. You said happen to get to reign. You do know how it happens, right? Like, do we have to have the birds and the bees and the thrones conversation? You don't have to about into it. <laughs> I mean, you know, you some, someday I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on the no, we're not making that joke. No. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on. So since we're having, uh, since I'm demonstrating such pure like behavior right now, actually, <laughs> I would like to ask, um, as uh, someone who has been a, um, you were recognized as a pelican twenty about twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've been fortunate enough to be involved in the reins. Um, what you've been to a few vigils over the years is kind of what uh, it is. Um, what is the core of the advice that you love that you try to impart on someone who's about to be recognized to appear? Mm -hmm. When they make you appear, they make you an equal. There is no senior pelican, there is no senior laurel, there is no one in that council who has a higher standing than you. You are being recognized because you, your fellow peerage members see you as an equal. So don't walk into your first meeting thinking, oh, I, I can't say anything, I have to be quiet. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I'm gonna just sit here and wait for a while and, you know, eventually I'll figure it out and then I'll raise my hand very meekly and say something. No, peer means equal. And don't ever feel like you can't say anything because you're, you are tasked with giving the crown advice about changing someone else's life. And that's what a peerage does. It, it's, it's more than just a recognition. It is a job and you are changing everything about that person's life in the SCA. So if you have something to say and good or bad, you should feel like you have every right to say what needs to be said as anybody else. So don't think, oh, well, you know, Duke Frederick of Holland, he's, you know, this big Uber Duke and he was at the first tournament and he's such a, a higher level, you know, ranking mage, you know, peer, whatever Pelican than I am. I'm just this lowly first meeting Pelican. No, you're not. You're just as much Pelican as he is. And so don't ever, don't ever think that. Don't ever think that you're less, you're a lesser peer because you're a new peer. I have fleeg stories we should talk sometime. Oh, yeah. We won't do it now. I have fleeg stories too. <laughs> <laughs> I want fun stories. <laughs> so I'll tell you my first my first fleeg story. So um, I moved to the West about 18 months or so after I joined the SCA. And I started fighting like almost immediately as soon as I got in, in the SCA. And uh, the very first tournament that I fought in was in the West and it was the St. Catherine's Warlord Tourney. And the reason why I fought in it beca was because a St. Catherine's and Catherine is my Monday name. Um, and um, Warlord is because I'm a war fighter. I'm not a tournament fighter, but I thought what the heck I'll fight in this tournament because I, you know, Warlord. And so uh, one of the, so it was a very, very small tournament. There's only like four or five of us, but one of the fighters there was to Frederick of Holland and I'd heard all the stories and I was like oh squee fan girl you know he was at the first event and and I was so excited um and we went to go they they called our fight and so I went to go fight him and I was just 
I was just so excited. And all he could see was this, this girl just grinning ear from ear. And he's thinking, why is she grinning? You know, and you know, is, is there something she doesn't know? And he kept throwing fakes and I kept not responding to them. And he's thinking, <laughs> oh no, man, she's not falling for any of my fakes. And she's grinning from ear to ear. There must be something that she knows that I don't know. And when he finally threw his first shot, I mean, he, you know, one shot, I was out like a light. But I just thought it was kind of funny that he thought I was, you know, some kind of threat because I wasn't, you know, and me, really, I was just sitting there just I'm fighting Duke Frederick. <gasps> That's awesome. He plagued me now. I mean, he became family like almost immediately. We hung out in their camp forever. So, you know, but in the beginning, you know, it's nice to have those, uh, those, you know, heroes that you look mm -hmm. up to. And he was our first recipient. Um, when I was princess of Sanagua, he kind of adopted our reign and just decided he wanted to herald a bunch for us, which was fine. Having a super experienced herald who wow. really wants to be there is not a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course I was reigning with Obadiah. So, mm -hmm. you know, big personality. Yeah. Yeah. Effective herald. That's a good combination. Mm -hmm. So when we created Dame Prima Ailing, which is the ugly duckling yep. for us, for Sanagua, we created it and he was the first recipient. Aww. So for people that weren't, we're going to be swans, we're going to be beautiful swans, but just look like cracked eggs so far. So we thought, oh God, got to give this to Fleeg as our first, you know, our first recipient. Does someone have to live in the principality to get that one? No, or? no, that it was specifically, specifically for people for. who weren't from the principality, but contributed to the culture and splendor of Sanagua so it was I was just caught on the cracked egg part sorry <laughs> <laughs> and Ob made these little silver pendants with little cracks on them that look like little eggs that with his own hands it was very very cool so you know and you do like people like that you know can make a rain a lot of fun you know I I felt that way in my first rain in Ontario when Ludviga decided she wanted to be our herald. And I'm like, how do I keep lucking out with these really amazing experienced people who want to babysit me as royalty? <laughs> so, hmm, wait, maybe they're trying to make sure the kingdom is okay? Or <laughs> maybe, maybe. You know, and that's yeah. a perfect segue actually into my next question. Um, Your Grace, uh, everyone kind of has those mentors in the SCA or, you know, the people that they looked at when they were young and um, in the game and they wanted to be like, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Who was your first SCA crush, so to speak? And, I'm, and I mean, in like the looking up to him way. And who's your current one? And do you want to give them a shout out? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go way, way back. And I actually didn't really know this person. Um, very in you know, this is my first year, my first event was in August, and um, I went to, I, I, I want to say it was a Three Mountains Yule, and um, Dowager Princess Janeltis was there, and I remember they, they, um, they had her sitting, you know, this is after the event, this is after court, but they had her sitting in state, and I remember waiting in a very long line to go up and meet her, and just thinking, oh. you know, that was just, it was so, she, and you know, she just radiated grace and beauty and kindness. Mm -hmm. And when, when I very, you know, calmly, meekly introduced myself and, and kind of bowed to her, she just took my hand and she kind of just patted my hand. She didn't say anything. She just patted my hand and off I went and the next person came along. And I just thought, oh, that's so sweet. And and I, that was when I was like, oh, you know, this whole princess thing, you know, that just seems like a cool thing. Never wanted to be queen. Princess, I thought that would be cool. But um, pretty early on, I started hanging out with, uh, I mean, my, my bestie and my sister in the SDA is um, by Countess Krista Starfall. And um, she, through her, um, we started hanging out with Fleeg and Ellis. I mean, they were, that was our camp. And so I pretty much grew up in the SDA around like 
the giants of yeah. the NBA. And so there was really never any pretension. I mean, we, we talk about being pretentiously unpretentious in the West, but really that's, I mean, when you, when you're camping with Fleeg and Ellis and it's just no big deal, you kind of, I don't want to say that you don't have that hero worship. I mean, but you, it's kind of nice that, that I was able to feel comfortable around people who had such a lineage and, or not a lineage, um, a legacy. Um, and um, I really appreciated that. And so I don't want to say that there weren't any um, heroes. Um, I always say that my, my laurel hero is um, Duchess Juana. Um, and the reason why she's always my, my laurel hero is because um, she got her laurel a million years ago. And she, I, she'll tell you that she got her laurel in something that isn't even period. But um, she went on to master work after work after work, you know, and she would just chant, oh, I'm going to do cheese making or now I'm going to do, you know, whatever underwater basket weaving I don't know what it was but she was constantly um, learning and growing and teaching and mastering new arts that she would pass on to other people and I always thought man if I ever became a laurel that's what I'd want you know and that's the kind of peer that I like is not just a you know one trick pony but a you know I am I am so passionate about learning and teaching and helping others find that same passion. Those are the kind of peers that I love. And whether it's fighting or service or anything, those are the people who I revere the most. Yeah, that's very cool. And I'm wondering if maybe we can go look at the photos because I think some of those folks are in your photos. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay, let's Possibly. do that. All right. Got to share the right screen here. Okay, so we've seen that one. So let's look at this one. So um, like I said, fighter. I've always, uh, I mean, from pretty much day one in the SEA, um, I loved being a fighter and I wanted to, to encourage other females to fight. And so in, in the West, we have a Queen's Guard, which we choose uh, who is going to be there. There's a Queen's Guard and a Knight Counselor who kind of helps to guide them while they're you know, guarding the Queen. And so for my first reign, I chose to have an all-female Queen's Guard and even had a female Knight Counselor. So Sir Bryn was my uh, Knight Counselor. And um, so that's the assembled uh, um, amazing women who are part of my uh, guard. And they came from all of the martial um, elements. There were heavy fighters, there were rapier fighters, um, archery, um, uh, siege weapons, um, equestrian, all of that. And um, so I really wanted to, to make sure that, that, I, that we got it out there that um, you, you can be anything you wanna be in the SCA and gender really doesn't play a part in it. And so that's what I wanted to. Well, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And it looks like we lost a uh, dag. I'm sure she'll hop right back on. Her, um, um, her internet crashed, so she's working on fixing that. Okay. Oh, here she comes. <laughs> there she is. Oh, oh. And she's back, yay. Um, <laughs> my, you know, my internet, everything just crashed. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you just fine. Okay, just you guys all froze and I was like trying to figure out all my buttons and do everything and I don't know what's happening. So if I go again, just continue without me, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry them. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I will say that is, that that's such an amazing thing with the um, with how you had your court there and encouraging everyone, no matter who who they may be, where they may be from, to uh, find find that safe space in the SCA, even if that safe space is you know our wonderful violence that we get to take out on the field. <laughs> I love Can you it. Um, I will say that uh, the ladies are a lot safer um, having you know clubs and fools. So you know. <laughs> That's my thought on that. Okay, should I continue with the slides? Is that okay? Yes. Sure. okay. sure. By the way, I, I'm going to go back though because I okay. missed some of the faces in that slide. 
I'm seeing a lot of familiar people and it makes yeah. me sad. Okay, next slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, my first rain, I was pregnant and uh, really bummed that I couldn't fight. Uh, you know, I couldn't fight as a queen and that had, I mean, I always thought if I ever was queen, I wanted to be, you know, you know, fighting queen and I couldn't fight. And so Great Western War, um, we had held court, this is before the battle, and we're giving our big, huge rah-rah speech of, you know, go forth and conquer in the name of the West. And um, I was really, it was really hard for me that I couldn't be out there with them. And so a group of the fighters walked up to me afterwards with their weapons and a Sharpie. And they said, your majesty, would you please sign our weapons so we could carry your name out to the field and deliver a blow from our queen. And I mean, I was pregnant, so I was crying at everything anyway, but boy, that just made me uh, cry just, and it was just such an, a fun experience. And that gentleman there um, in the purple, um, he was the captain of my guard in my second reign. And, um, and he had been, um, I, I'd known him pretty much from the time I joined the SCA. And so he's been a, a fixture of my SCA life um, forever. And one of the last things that, that I got to do as queen the second time was um, knight him. Nice. And that was uh, an amazing yep. journey. Um, these are two of the most amazing women on the face of this planet. That is uh, Danielle, who's kneeling down, and um, now Mistress Kelsey, who is walking up. Um, they were um, they were with with me throughout my first reign and Kelsey in my second reign, um, like at every single event, they were right by my side. They had everything handled. Um, I never had to worry about something being taken care of. They were always there to, to, to do whatever needed to be done, no questions asked. And we have this uh, award, as you can see, the Queen's Order of Maintenance. And um, it is given really for um, that exceptional service um, to the to the queen or the, the, the concert, the, um, and uh, these two women more than earned that, uh, that award. And I, I, I cannot tell you how much I uh, appreciated them. Um, so one of the other things that the West has is they have, in addition to uh, Queen's Guard, they also have Queen's Artisans. And again, it's, it's a, a sampling of uh, artisans who have not been made a laurel yet. And uh, we have a, a laurel council as well. And I had Master Wolfric, who was my laurel counselor in my first reign. And he, um, he is a charcuterer. I'm sure I'm messing that up. But anyway, uh, his, uh, they presented me with uh, 12 days of bacon. He had made 12 different kinds of bacon and nice. presented this to me. And uh, like it says, it's, I'm four days away from giving birth in this picture. So Wait, um, food of- You wait around, you get bacon? I, what the? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so Joel, when you're queen, um, <laughs> there, someone might be nice enough to give you 12 days of bacon. I'm just, you know, if you're really nice. And, and uh, please let everyone know who's standing next to you. And that is my dear friend who's now Duchess Ellis. Yep. And, and uh, I also want to mention the thrones of the West, which are oh gosh. the wow. most epic thrones yeah. of the known world as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I would have to agree with you. They are truly um, awe-inspiring. And it's lovely to see at, um, if you, I mean, total brag, but you go to, um, they, these ones don't make it out to Penzik, but if you go to Great Western or Estrella, you'll yep. see these thrones there. And it's, it's really amazing to see all the other thrones um, lined up. And um, these ones really do stand out. Um, Can you say who made them? Um, I want to, 
gosh, this is where my brain, uh, names are really hard for me. I have yeah. a, a memory problem with names. And I, I want to say his name is Tim. Someone will pipe up in the chat yeah. or we can make sure it's yeah. added to the chat so yeah. that um, the artist is definitely yeah. acknowledged. So, I, so and do I, those come I, with their I own know made them. Huh? <laughs> They live in a bubble wrap castle on top of a, a hill, Joel. So made of, made of packing foam. I would made be of packing foam and bubble wrap. Those and, those and, yeah. so... <laughs> They're amazing. They're, They're amazing. amazing. All right, here we go. Um, <laughs> um, don't ever let anybody tell you that you are too humble to receive any award, nor that no amount of service will ever go unrewarded or unpunished, depending on your point of view. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of a joke, um, uh, way back when, a million years ago, um, I actually did get my AOA, um, but it was never published. And so it didn't actually happen. And to be honest, the reason that they gave me my AOA, I, um, um, it was not, a. a what I thought was a, a deserving reason for giving my OA. So I never like really pushed the fact that my OA didn't get published and so it was never official. So forever, you know, I, I mean, of course everybody assumed that I had uh, an AOA and all this, but I, I really didn't get a lot of awards. I got a leap of merit, which is like the mid-level service award. And 18 months later, I got my Pelican. Those were really like my first two, event, uh, two awards in the SCA. Yeah. So it didn't really matter that I didn't have my AOA because technically my leaf merit came with an AOA. But what I didn't realize is that while I didn't push for my AOA to get published, my friend Kelsey, who ended up, who was in that picture earlier, who ended up being my protege and one of my dearest friends, um, she also got her AOA that same day. Oh. So so it was always kind of this joke that we shared was that we never got our AOAs. And so eventually at one point during um, Jeffrey, this is Jeffrey and Catherine, and they were uh, Prince of Prince of the Mist. And I think it was in a previous reign of theirs, they gave Kelsey her AOA. And so in this reign, this is uh, about uh, two months before I stepped up the second time and they called me up and I'm thinking, what the heck? And uh, then they started reading the, the litany for AOA and I'm just, I'm losing it here. Pretty much everybody was losing it, but yeah, 26 years. It's very procedural humor, like administrative humor, because of course, all of your awards, like your peerages, all of that, they're all armigerous. Like you don't yeah. need an AOA, but it is sort of a, a piece of SCA administrative shtick that is yeah. charming when it happens. So uh, this is a great picture. So uh, Awartha is one of our beloved principalities and it is the whole of Alaska. And so whenever Ontier talks about how, how big they are. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I kind of point to Alaska a little bit, but anyway, um, so uh, their coronet, coronet tournament, they have uh, one in January and one in July. And um, this, is, this is their January coronet tournament, obviously, and it's snow on the ground everywhere and it was freezing cold. Um, I think that day, uh, I know the day before this, it was negative 20 where we were. So this was really cold, but, um, and that is Soren on the, no, Oh, that's not Soren. I'm sorry. No, that's that's Skaggy on the on the right. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. And um, that's not Soren. That's and F, uh, Facebook is going to kill me with names because I, I can't. I'm the same. Me. I am the same. Like I can see his his Facebook profile, and he has a very lovely wife. And um, but I, I can't remember his SCA name, and I. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. But okay. uh, so this is their, them fighting. And I want to say this is like semifinals. Yeah. Is, is this is, but 
I finally got to fight. I was so <laughs> excited. So I finally got to fight at Australia, and here I am, not leading my troops per se, but you know, ambling in behind them. <laughs> and uh, I, when we inducted the guard, uh, this was not an all-female guard. The second time, I kind of spread the wealth amongst genders there. But uh, one of the things that I said was that um, if any of them should ever come between me and harm, that they would be sorely disappointed and they would, they would feel the wrath of their queen should they ever prevent me from actually, you know, seeing some, you know, battle time. So uh, they were all wonderful. And um, in the front there with that really fancy um, shield there is uh, uh, Sir, oh, I, I keep wanting to call him Plishka, but I'm sure there's more to his name than that. And I, it's killing me again, names. I'm, I have a memory problem with names and that, but he was my, um, my champion mm -hmm. and he was so dear. He made sure that I got to the front of the line every time. And he would, you know, find holes for me to shoot fools and, you know, try to try <laughs> to get as much time as I could. And I mean, I, I failed spectacularly, but you know, I was just happy to be there. And um, I had such a wonderful experience uh being queen and being quiet and here i am 25 years after my very first estrella where i got my first oleander and they're like oh well now we have these golden oleanders and apparently if you're queen at pens or at, at estrella and you fight they give you these these golden oleander uh uh favors to wear so that's cool that was a that was a pretty pretty wonderful <laughs> and there I am being a goof. Oh, I just want to point out that our interviewees provide their own photos. We do not go and find photos of them and put them into these. We ask for their hand selected photos. So with that in mind, that's where this photo came from. <laughs> so, so um sorry. Uh -huh. I I am, uh, and uh, Anton there uh, yeah. will tell will be able to tell funny stories about me screwing up the food that we were cooking uh, at the Estrella I was knighted at really badly, super badly. Is that the they hot still, dog they, story? They, yeah, that's the hot dog story. Yeah, you screwed up hot dogs. Super yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's an accomplishment. Yeah, this is a great photo, Skills. and thank you for including it. Uh, this is my favorite event, Gulf Wars. Um, highly recommended. Um, and uh, one of the things I was the most excited about reigning this particular reign, because like um, Her Grace said, uh, there are three reigns uh, in the West, three um, kingdom level reigns. And so I really wanted to reign the reign that took place during Gulf Wars, mostly because I wanted to ride a horse. I thought that would be cool. And this horse was was awesome. Um, Sorry, hang on. Oh, um, this Great. horse was <laughs> awesome in that, uh, so when they're, you know, they come and they bring out, you know, you, you have in the meet, meet and greet with the horses and they bring out these, this big, huge, like black stallion. I mean, it's a big, huge honking, like, I don't know, big, big horse, big black horse. And I'm thinking, that's what I want to ride. And, um, and then they bring out this little blonde horse and they, we go and talk and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm totally riding that big black one. You know, I'm, I want to get up on that. And uh, then they started talking about how this particular horse was a, a little bit skittish and um, they, you know, it, it, it was, you know, easily spooked and all this kind of stuff. And the person I was reigning with had never really had any experience on horses. And I'm like, crap, he's going to get the nice big black horse and I'm going to get the skittish one. And so the whole time we're riding into the procession, I kept looking for soft spaces to land because this, ho this horse was really not so happy about doing this thing, but, uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And Boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I loved that. So we all love seeing Skeggy hit across the face by somebody. So this is a great photo to include. <laughs> so um, love you, Sean. When, when we offered him 
admittance into the order, um, I had asked him, you know, hey, you can have it, you know, you can have a buffet, you don't have to have a buffet, you know, it's really up to you. And he said, well, you know, I would be okay, you know, if you gave me a buffet, but I'd also be okay if you just gave me a kiss. So I gave him both. <laughs> Because, I mean, how many people get to walk up and smack Skaggy across the face? I mean, I wasn't going to pass up that opportunity. I mean, so, some people get to do it, but well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not everybody gets to do it and get away with it. So, yeah. there. Yeah. And, um, this, okay, so this, this picture is from Penzik, but I love the Rose's Happy Hours. And I love them so much that um, along with Duchess Ellis, um, we were commenting once at Gulf Wars that we don't have a Rose's happy hour at Gulf Wars. And we're like, why, why don't we have, well, let's, let's host it. And that next year I was queen at Gulf Wars. So the first year that I hosted, it was because I was queen and I was like, okay, sure, I'll do this thing. And then we just sort of happened to have it every year since. But I really, really love the Rose's Happy Hours, mostly because all of these wonderful countesses and duchesses and by countesses, because I invite everybody, um, they've all been through something unique and special. And they've all had their horror stories. They've all had um, beautiful, wonderful moments. And when we get together and yeah, a lot of it is we're getting together and we're getting lit and we're, you know, goofing off. But really a lot of it is we have this wonderful cadre of women and, and men. We now have some men who are amazing um, who can get together and talk about our experience being queen without feeling like we're being pretentious. You know, we, we don't have to, you know, be we don't have to couch our words yeah and be on open and honest yeah with each other because we've all been there and it's really wonderful to talk to someone who has been through an experience whether it's good or bad and just kind of be like oh man I thought I was the only one mm -hmm. and to find out no you aren't like a lot of us have gone through that exact same thing so um and these are my two, my two um, youngest boys. I have a, a, an older son, but these are who fill my world these days. That's uh, Ben and Sam. So the one on the left, he was uh, in utero for the entirety of my first ring. And uh, so. It's a great photo. Yeah. Like that's the SCA to me is sort of this joy. So, mm -hmm. well, thank you for sharing those. That was really cool. And it's actually a really nice segue into our next question, which has to do with privilege. Mm -hmm. And you talked several times about, um, you know, the role of um, royal consorts in, um, you know, the difficulties and the things that you experience and the disappointments that you encounter when you learn things you didn't want to know and all of that. But of course, we also know that there's an enormous amount of privilege that's entailed on a person once they've reigned and both during the reign and after. And one of the things we love to talk about on this interview series is how can you use your privilege and do you use your privilege to make the SCA more inclusive or to raise awareness about um, issues in the SCA um, around um, inclusion and the barriers for um, other that people experience who try to come to the SCA and enjoy it? Um, one of my proudest little things that I could do because I was queen, so why not? Right. Um, written into the laws of our kingdom was reinstating what corporal law was on who could and couldn't enter crown tournament lists. And at the time, it stated that the consort needed to be someone of the opposite gender unless the crown decided that it was okay for members of the same gender to fight for one another. And I thought that is not who we are 
as a kingdom. Um, and that is not who I want us to be. And corpora can do what they want. They can say that in their laws, but we're not gonna say it in ours. And so we removed that piece of gender bias from our laws and went through and removed anything that, that made mention of gender of any kind, because that, that isn't who we are and that's not who we should be. And uh, so that was, I, I'm like, if I have this power, that's what I'm gonna do. You know, so that was a, that was a thing I was very, very happy to do. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I've, I've, you have plenty of crowns out there who really surf the list fields during their entire reigns. And they hang out with people who are up front and center and who are peers and who are well-renowned. And, you know, I do spend a good deal of time with those people, but what I enjoyed the most during my reigns, both of them, was going out. Going out to the pirate camp and sitting down on the ground with all the other ladies of the camp and chatting with them and running around and meeting people who don't come up the list field area, who aren't part of the main activities. Because if we don't make them feel included, they're never gonna, you know, they're not gonna come back. You know, if all they ever see is this is, you know, that that's over there, the, that's where the clicks go. That's where the, you know, the hoity-toity go and hang out. And I will never be part of them. Well, you know what, I used to be one of you. You know, I used to be just a nobody, nobody. And, but being a nobody is not the worst thing in the world. And we make such a big deal out of being a peer and being royalty and being all of this. When really, who is the biggest base of our society? Mm -hmm. it, it's not the peers. It's not the crown. It's, it's your everyday populace who are busting their tails to put on the events and to show up and to participate and to make this as great a place as it can. And those are the people that we need to spend our time and energy on. The people who are peers, they already got this. Mm -hmm. We don't need to cater to them. They, they, you know, they're the ones who should be going out and doing that outreach and going out to the outer king or the outer areas of the camp and introducing themselves and sitting down and just getting to know them. I mean, the, the wonderful conversations that I had with people out there, you know, who, who had never, ever actually been up to where the list field was. It was interesting to hear their perspective of the SCA. I'm. Uh, I want to go back to your first um, topic, which is when you change the kingdom law mm -hmm. in the West, because we did the same in Ontario in our last mm -hmm. reign. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a question in the comments about how does that work when your crown lists are less restrictive than Kapora? And I, I know that in Ontario, we simply changed it that we took it out of our laws. Kapora mm -hmm. still overrode what we were able to do because Corpora still stated at the time that it mm -hmm. had to be a man and a woman. And we removed it from our, mm -hmm. our kingdom law, understanding that Corpora overrode yeah. that. Is I mean, that. Was it the Corp same in the West at the time? Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, Corpora still stood. And right. I mean, we just took the, the only thing that our law said was they had to be over 18 and they had to be a member. Right. And, you know, and they had to be acceptable to the crown, all that right. stuff. Right. But Corpora will always override kingdom law. Yeah, that's just the truth. Um, and so we knew that that part, but, but as far as we were concerned in right. the West, that was never, not never, but that was not going to be in our laws as right. a barrier to entry into our crown tournaments. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that. any decision that, makes it so that the SCA can be that that dream to everybody, um, whether it's the French players who never come down to the field. And I'm not saying French players in like a negative term. I, I, I started as a fringe in a very remote group. Um, 
but anything that we can do to make it so it's more welcoming to everybody, no matter where their, no matter where their game is, is that's amazing and something that needs to be done. And, you know, whatever we can do, like with your uh, your shield maidens, um, you know, where uh, anything that we can make people feel more badass. That's sorry, I'm gonna I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Joel, stick chop that a little bit. Do you really want me to feel more badass? I think there's some. Well, risk it's a balancing that. act with you. Yeah, okay. So, like, I'm already intimidated by you, so. No, no, no. Oh, God. Oh, no, no, no. Bad idea. Don't don't admit that. Never, never admit that. So. <laughs> so, um, what is, um, so you, you were talking about how you've been able to affect these big changes in the SCA and in and, and your groups and in your kingdoms. If there was one award you could create with no drama, no, you know, no need to ask for outside or pillow politics, you could just snap an award into existence. What would that award be and why would you give it to me? So I'm not a big award person. Um, and part of it also is because in the West, we don't have a lot of awards. We have a arts and sciences award. We have a fighter award. We have a service award. You know, we have a, you know. So um, I think what, one of the things, and this is one of the things that we did in um, the sec, our second ring. Um, what I wanted to really promote isn't so much giving someone an award but rather giving someone recognition. So we made a point of calling people into court and publicly acknowledging their contribution to the society. There was no token at the end. Well, although we did give them, you know, tchotchkes and things, but you know, they didn't have an award because sometimes you have somebody who has absolutely everything well, do you just stop acknowledging them because they have absolutely everything? Or do you keep creating more and more awards for people to have to work towards? But I think we, I think one of the faults of the society is that we make things so award and title driven. And I'd really love it if we were more recognition driven and recognition isn't isn't a, a thing it's just acknowledging someone's contribution and they don't have to have a little jingle jangle around their neck to feel like they are appreciated and welcomed and that they are part of this greater society and I think when we keep talking about awards and and oh well I have such and such award and therefore therefore what are you better than anybody else who doesn't have it? I mean, maybe that person just hasn't been recognized because often we don't see everyone in the kingdom and what they're doing and their contribution. But I don't want anybody to ever feel like because they don't have some little token around their neck that they aren't still valued. And so I wouldn't create a new award, but I would go out of my way to recognize people and make them feel validated just by being here and by their contribution. That's what I want more than anything. So, so then no. what keeps you, what keeps you in the SCA then? Like what continues to inspire you? Because you, you're a Royal peer, you're a Pelican, you have a court barony, like you, if you're not motivated by awards, which clearly at this point, you know, you wouldn't be because you have a nice little dragon horde that you can sit on and add like a little to, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, I'd like to someday be worthy of a laurel. That would okay. be, you know, that'd be awesome. So, so striving but, for a laurel, but what else, like what inspires you to stay in the SCA at this point? This is my yeah. family. This yeah. is my family. I grew up in a very religious household. And um, when uh, the, the, around the time that I decided religion was not for me, mm -hmm. I found the SCA. Yeah. And so everything you know, what religion did for me in my childhood was it taught me community. Yeah. Um, and so 
that is what I found in the SCA is I found a community. I found a place where, um, you know, I belong and where I make friends and, and I make enemies and I, you know, and you have all of the things that you would have in any other community, but um, this is, this is a lifestyle. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's my chosen lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, that that's such a big thing. And it's been brought up a couple of interviews now that the SCA is kind of a lifestyle that, you know, it just, it becomes this huge part of, of what we do. Like, you know, doing these interviews, I am terrified of speaking in front of people. And here I am live streaming because the mm -hmm. SCA is, uh, you know, it's something that's huge and it's a big part of of my lifestyle. And if I can't go out there and get beaten up by my friends right now, I need to, <laughs> I need to do something. And uh, uh, so what do you see the SCA being like on the other side of the pandemic? We know that obviously, you know, even with the vaccine coming out soon, hopefully um, that still gets, there's going to be a transitional period and it, and it may never go back to what it was, but what do you see the SCA being like once we're able to start playing together again? My hope is that it's kinder. Kinder is good. I would like that people would come out of here being a little more forgiving, um, a little more gentle, a little more patient. Um, Just happy I, to I, see each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I really hope that when we are able to safely meet again, that we remember that this is our community, this yeah. is our family, yeah. and that it is not about status or anything. It is about people who you've made a conscious choice to spend time with, and that all of us have a place here and um, a value that we bring. And I really just hope that people are kinder. It's a great point. And we always end these interviews um, with a, an epic basket, a gift basket that we wish we could give you and full of kindness and affection. So um, as we wrap up, um, let me ask you a few questions that normally we would have had someone, you know, on our retinue, ask your retinue, like do a little intel first. So, um, but we're just going to ask you darker milk chocolate dark but not too dark not dark but okay like a nice 70 percent mm -hmm. yeah. yeah red or white wine vodka vodka okay that's kind of a white wine I mean <laughs> um and are you more of, of a puppies or kittens kind of person pigs pigs okay this is great so we are giving you a beautiful pigs. gift basket pigs. Pigs. Yes, I just take device. <laughs> okay, we're giving you a beautiful virtual gift basket, so we can put anything we want in it because we can't actually give it to you. So it has some beautiful, like local seventy percent chocolate, like something from you know one of those places where you can like go and actually watch hipsters make it in person, and some so you know, yeah, some kind of nice. Down the okay, Shaxi is recommending Moonstruck. That would be good. Okay. Theo's chocolates would be good. Something really something interesting, you know, that maybe you can share or not. You can keep it all to yourself if you want. Um, some nice, um, oh, poor Joel. He never gets any, um, some nice, some nice vodka. And I'm thinking it's going to be something like with an epic bottle that has a story, like something really interesting looking. And then um, what we're going to offer you in terms of the pigs is like, you can go and like spend time with a couple of darling little piglets and you can choose what happens to them if they're going to end up as somebody's pet. Or days if, you're a, if you're a mega bacon fan, okay, they're going to be cultivated into bacon. Totally <laughs> your choice. Um, but then also, because this is a virtual gift basket, by the way, this basket has no handles because oh, good. Good. handled baskets are the devil uh, and not in a hot way. So mm -hmm. we're going to give you um, in your gift basket a studio of lace makers who are going to sit, they're, they're gonna be well fed and cared for and you are able to order whatever lace you need to outfit your favorite whatever, I'm not from a lace culture in, in the SCA, so whatever lacy lacing things you need okay. that need to be lacy, 
they you have a studio of lace makers who are going to sit and very happily with um, benefits and and it's a union shop they're going to make you lace to wear on your lace outfits my fancy dancy your fancy dancy stuff so that is in our gift basket that we're giving to you it's kind of heavy sorry those people weigh those people weigh yeah, they have human They're white as feathers. They're lace makers. Bless okay, me. all right. Perfect, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we so appreciate your time and it's been a charm and a pleasure to talk with you, Zenobia. Thank you, thank you. I had fun. Thank you, thank you for nice. inviting me. Thank you so much. We really, really do enjoy um, getting to spend time with this. Um, Grace, I don't think we've actually met in person. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity when we do get to hang out again. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody stay safe out there. Join us next week. We'll be interviewing Duchess B. Not going to screw up the kingdom name again, I promise. Um, But we will be uh, uh, keeping these interviews going as long as we can. Uh, Buy your membership. Buy your membership. I forgot my segue. Oh, my goodness. I'm fired. (laughs) your membership. membership. Renew your membership, free your membership if you can. Otherwise, help friends out, do what you can, wear your mask, stay safe. We love you. We will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you.